Hi, I'm Melissa, and this is The Book Break. And today I'm really excited to introduce you to Mark Leslie Lefebvre, who is also not just a writer, but horror, nonfiction, teacher, speaker. And I just want to bring him in. Let's bring in Mark. Hey, Melissa. Great to be here. Hi, Mark. I'm excited to have you. So you came on the show a couple years ago and we talked about your horror stuff and briefly mentioned your nonfiction. But today I want to talk a little bit more about your nonfiction. Sure. I'm always eager to talk about my books, no matter what kind they are. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, you have a series of books to help authors. And we've got those images that we can show here. So tell us a little bit more, which one was your first book? Which I've got one of them on the shelf behind me too. And I, this yeah. is my first of your books, nonfiction I read. Well, that's the seven P's of publishing success. And what that really is, is a really short book. It's maybe only about 15,000 words. And it's, uh, I found a pattern. Uh, I, and, and I went with P's because I like alliteration. So I had the seven P's of publishing success. And it's just the things that, most uh, in, in my 30 years in, in writing and publishing, uh, consistent things that authors had in common who were very successful, patience, practice, persistence, um, a patronage, and partnerships, and all of these different elements that when you put them all together, create success. And that's been, uh, that was the first one that came out. And then I did Killing It on Kobo, maybe four to six months later, I had just left Kobo, which is kind of Canada's answer to Kindle. And I wanted to offer people, because uh, every book out there is about Amazon and there's very few books on the other platforms. So having built the platform Kobo Writing Life, I had a lot of insights into it and just shared sort of in one in one place what people could do to be, you know, to maximize their, uh, their earnings on Kobo. Then, uh, you know, just last year or the year before, I'm trying to remember, I did an author's guide to working with bookstores and libraries because whether you're traditionally published or self-published, I think it's really important for authors to understand the business of running a library, the business of running a bookstore and how authors can interact with them in a way that satisfies that business, thinking of them rather than thinking of you as the author. And then, of course, the the latest book that just came out this year in 2021 is wide for the win. And this is the movement of exclusive to Amazon with ebook or publishing your books uh, wide to all the platforms. And my version of wide, I use mm. uppercase letters, is not just thinking about ebooks and Amazon versus uh, Am Apple, Nook, Kobo, and Google, but it's thinking about you as a professional entrepreneur who has an incredible IP to offer because you're a creative spirit. And publishing that wide, and, and whether that's working with publishers, in some cases working uh, self-publishing or indie publishing, and even the other ways that you can leverage your IP to make a long-term scalable career as an author. Yeah, I love that. And one of the questions I get asked the most when I'm doing consulting with authors is about distribution and what they should do about it. And actually, you just wrote a guest article for us that's on thebookbreak.com. So if you guys want to check out the very short version, you can check out that article and you'll find you're going to want to read the whole book wide for the win. <laughs> but you also um, work for draft to digital and tell us about that because that is such a great platform. And you talk about that a little bit in your books, too. Yeah. So even the article uh, that I uh, put together for, for the book break is uh, sort of a Reader's Digest version of the <laughs> chapter on how do you decide between publishing direct, like going direct to Kindle and Kobo and Apple and Nook and all those places, or using a distributor or an aggregator like Draft2Digital. And that's what Draft2Digital.com is is a place where you can, if you don't wanna to have to have six accounts and log into six different places, you can manage it from a central place. Uh, the difference typically is the 10%, right? You they, they keep 10% because it's a free platform. So that's how they make their money. Uh, but even if you don't use Draft Digital for distribution, you can still go there and create an EPUB for free. They'll let you take a Word document, use some pre-built templates that kinda of look sexy and like, you know, traditionally published books with nice uh, drop caps and all kinds of different mm -hmm. features. And there's about 18 or 19 different templates by genre. And then you can kind of export that and then publish it directly or sell it yourself, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, and that's free. Uh, other things that draft to digital offers for free, regardless of how you publish, is um, the universal book links, books to read.com. For example, I have my books that are 
Self-published, I have a universal book link, but my traditionally published books, like Haunted Hospitals, for example, is traditionally published. So I, you know, I've signed over all my rights to a publisher, but I can still make a universal book link so that in the back of any of my books, it doesn't matter how my book's published or who publishes it, I can have a link to all my books and it links to all the retailers rather than trying to drive them to a single retailer. Because I don't know when someone picks up my book where and how they read. I want them to be able to say, oh, okay, I, I'll, I'll get this on Apple or I'll get this on Amazon or I'll get this on Kobo, wherever. Uh, I like allowing the reader that flexibility. Yeah, I love that too. And and I think it's it's difficult for people sometimes to decide whether they're going to like be exclusive to one platform too. And um, in some of your books, you mentioned that. And then also in your libraries and bookstores book, you talk about if you want to get into these places, there are certain things that you need to do. And I kind of want to touch on that a little bit and um, how you can get into the libraries and bookstores. Well, uh, for eBooks, you can, for, for example, to use draft to digital as an example, you, all you have to do is check a box that says distribute to these library platforms. Uh, Overdrive, probably the, the most well-known one for North America. And uh, that's, they do eBooks and audiobooks. Uh, so you can get your eBooks into drafted uh, Overdrive from draft to digital, but then you have Biblioteca, you have Baker and Taylor, you have other uh, platforms as well and more coming. There's two in beta right now that haven't been released. Hoopla's live, but there's a couple other ones. So that's one way for eBooks. The other way uh, I usually recommend is either, you know, use draft to digital print is now in beta. That goes through Ingram, which is the world's largest wholesaler distributor, and that's currently in a beta release right now, or uh, a place like Ingram Spark, where when you make your books available there, that, you know, Ingram is the world's largest wholesaler for print books. And so when you're contacting a library to let them know, uh, I, I do a one sheet, for example, and say, well, here's uh, my new book, here's what it's about, here's who it's going to appeal to. I also try to find comp titles. It's an industry term where I say, well, if they like for example, if they like, you know, James Patterson meets Michael uh, Connolly, that, you know, so readers who enjoy both of those uh, will probably enjoy this series. And then you give them the ISBNs for the ebook, for the audiobook, if you have one, for the print book. And then that makes it as easy as possible for the library, for example, to, if they want to order it, they know. I'll say, my book's available from Overdrive. It's available from Biblioteca, Baker and Taylor. Here's the ISBN. Uh, you got you to gotta make it as easy as possible for them to go, oh, that's easy. I'll I'll order that. Yeah, that's great. And and if those authors are watching this and they're trying to decide, well, what's the benefit for me? Because if I go on Amazon and I'm exclusive to them and I do uh, Kindle Unlimited, I'll make more sales that way. But I, I want to talk about that. What would be some yeah. reasons why you would or wouldn't want to go exclusive? So yeah, if you go exclusive to Amazon, you have the opportunity to make money off of Kindle Unlimited page reads. Um, there's a chance you could make money, and there are then there are authors making really good bank, you know, some upwards of five and six figures a month in some cases. Although that's like saying I could sell like Stephen King too. That's the one percent <laughs> or the five percent. Very very few are making that. More often, some authors are making some money off of that. But the one thing you're guaranteed, 100% guaranteed, uh, is to not make any money on any other platform. Uh, and the other thing, and it happened again this week, some stuff happened and a system issue happened at uh, Amazon, like nothing nefarious, just, just a system issue that happened. And there were authors who suddenly, oh my God, my books disappeared from the Amazon catalog. Well, I wasn't, uh, it didn't happen to me, uh, but I wasn't panicked about it because my books are on you know, dozens of other websites. So it's yeah. not like, oh my God, my only source of income is dried up. The only store in town is closed. Uh, and, and that's the difference. Uh, the wide mindset in my mind is a longer term thinking uh, mindset. It's maybe even more in line with authors who have been traditionally published where you think long term uh, rather than looking at your KDP dashboard and hitting refresh every five minutes and wondering how you're doing. Uh, and so that wide for the win Really, to be quite honest, 60% of the book is, it's not tactics. There are tactics and strategies. I tried to make it as evergreen as possible, although things do change. That's the tricky part And when talking about specific platforms. But it's mindset. It's like, okay, we all know Amazon's the world's biggest bookstore. We all know most of your sales in the U.S. are going to come from there. But what are the things you can do 
to stop thinking of Amazon only, uh, including you know Universal Book Links, or including when you're uh, when you're doing promos or buying gifts to sign up for your newsletter. You know, Erin Wright, who wrote the foreword for the book, said she stopped buying Kindles as giveaways for different contests for her readers, and she started buying. She picked Kobo because she thought that was a really awesome uh, platform. But you know, Nooks and iPads, like there's no reason why you couldn't go with something else, uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of the a lot of the default positioning authors have always just drives people to Amazon, and uh, and and I'm a I'm a fan of multiple streams of revenue from as many places as possible, even outside the ebook world. So that if anything happens to any one of those, you can look at it and go, wow, okay, I didn't lose 60% of my revenue. I lost 10% or 20%. That's easier to make up for than panicking and go, oh my God, how am I going to pay the mortgage this month? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And we're close to being out of time, but I really want to talk really quickly about your fiction stuff for a minute, because you are also a horror writer, which if we look at the background of your uh, shelf there, we can see a skeleton. So this is, and you're a fun horror writer. So tell us a little bit about this book right here. Fear and Longing in Los Angeles is the latest in my Canadian werewolf series that started with a Canadian werewolf in New York. And it's really just a look, it's an urban fantasy uh, the side effects of living with being a wolf, like the, the logistics of where do you hide your clothes? How do you deal with that? How do you actually have a relationship when for, you know, 10 days during the month, you can't be with them at night? <laughs> are, are they having an affair? So there's lots of weird things that happen. So it's kind of dark humor, thriller-esque. And in this one, he has the the thrill of going to, to Los Angeles, where he ends up encountering a, a, a white supremacist hate group uh, mm -hmm. and learns that, oh, my God, there's other people with supernatural powers. This isn't going to be as easy to defeat them as the average thug. Yeah, that's fun. And I think that's one thing I would want our viewers to know is that you do write horror, but it you it's humorous, too. <laughs> so <laughs> they will have a good time reading it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Mark. And where can our viewers go to learn more about you? If you go to marklesley.ca, you can find links to me all over the internet. And Melissa, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. You too. And thank you to our viewers. We'll see you next time.